All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the uh, Half Court Podcast. My name is Noah. We're back with my uh, my boy Mike, and uh, still no live basketball to talk about, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, saw a news report earlier. Um, I think it was there a couple days ago, saying that the season might be coming back within about a month. So fingers crossed, knock on wood, that that does happen. But in the meantime, um, we we got a few few things we want to talk about here. Um, so our first topic that we're going to be talking about is um, kind of talking about the Olympics. I know they are moved until next year, but um, we're going to be just talking about kind of Canada's team, the U.S. team, um, kind of the overall how we thought the Olympics were going to go. And um, if we want to, we can kind of talk about how, um, how we think they're going to go next year. Um, and then if we have time, depending on how long that segment takes, we're also going to talk about who our uh, top 25 uh, foreign-born basketball players were this season. Um, so not, again, just the season, not talking about their entire careers, but, um, just based on the 2019, 2020 season, yeah. but we will get to that in a little bit. So, um, first second segment I want to talk about is Canada's rise in the NBA and talking about who we think is going to be on the, the Olympic team. So, I mean, obviously in the past couple of years, I'd say probably starting with Andrew Wiggins, yeah. uh, Canadian basketball has started to explode a little bit more. And I think that does have something to do with um, Steve Nash because a lot, of the, a lot of the guys who are in the league right now who are Canadian are younger guys. So they would have grown up watching Steve Nash. And I think he had a big impact on what we're seeing right now. So do you agree with that? Yeah, no, he's, uh, he's definitely helps in a lot of ways. Like I, I grew up wanting to be Steve Nash, like, um, but I definitely think that Canadian – players have been growing more and more and more kind of like in, in any country I guess but like yeah I, it kind of feels like Canadian born basketball players have been growing at a steady like a more steady pace than what the other guys are doing right like no for sure I mean and the thing that I was I've been kind of thinking about with um, like watching the guys this season is like we all like our kind of generation grew up kind of idolizing and wanting to be like Steve Nash which kind of created this whole kind of new crop of Canadian guys to come into the NBA. Mm-hmm. But now moving forward with that is we're now going to have, we probably now have kids who are 9, 10, 11 years old who are thinking, I want to grow up to be like RJ Barrett. I want to grow up to be like Andrew Wiggins. I want to be up, grow up to be like Jamal Murray, like those kind of guys like who are really having an impact. And I think that that's going to be even, which means in the next 10 years, we're going to have even more Canadian players come yeah. into the NBA. And then those guys are going to, um, kind of mold the youth of Canada's basketball program to be like them, and then it's just going to kind of be a, a nice repeating cycle. I think that cycle does have to have to start with Steve Nash. He's kind of the pioneer of Canadian basketball. What do you mean? It was it was clearly Jamal McGlure, actually. <laughs> Clear, shut up. <laughs> uh, but just like knowing that, like you know, a guy from guy from Canada can grow up, and again, like, and he's. I think Steve Nash was like the perfect guy for that because he wasn't the he wasn't the biggest he wasn't the most 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 athletic apologies, yeah. um, right? But he he just kind of demonstrated like that passion and drive to play the game at a high level, and I mean he's got two MVPs to prove for it now, so clearly was doing something right. <laughs> so, but again, now since we kind of mentioned guys like Jamal Murray, Wiggins. RJ Barrett, um, and then also kind of as previously mentioned, talking about the Olympics and everything. Did you want to get into who we think if the Olympics were happening this year? Again, we know that they're not, but if they were, who we think that the um, 15 man roster for the Olympics would be? Yeah, let's kind of start with the starters here and let's kind of just talk about each player individually. Obviously, at point guard, you got to go with um, Nuggets guard Jamal Murray. I think for sure he's been consistently one of the better Canadian players in the world, I think. And I think the fact that he plays with Jokic and his his pick and roll game is unreal. And I think he'd be able to run it really well with the power forward we have here as well. And I just think that he, he's been consistent for this team, especially come playoff time. He, he, he shines in the bigger moments. And I think that he, he can definitely run that point guard spot for the Canadian Olympic team. So, yeah, if you want to talk about the shooting. Yeah, for sure. So I'm just going to – adding on like you said about Jamal Murray is um, not only obviously as Canadians kind of have a soft spot for other Canadians in the NBA, but 
but clearly the other people in the NBA itself feel confident in Jamal Murray's not because he's a very good basketball player right now, but yeah, they clearly believe he's going to be an even better player. Obviously, with his new contract that he he signed yeah. last summer, what was it? Five years, one seventy, one sixty six, or something like that. Yeah, something something crazy. So clearly, he's he's made his mark as as early in his, into his career as he is. He's clearly he's clearly already made his mark on other other people in the association, and he's clearly he's now got the contract to back that up. Yeah. Um, so moving on to our who we think is going to be the starting shooting guard, um, we I have Shea Gilders Alexander. Um, I genuinely think Shea's currently the best um, Canadian player in the NBA right now. Um, you could make the case that Wiggins is Wiggins or Murray could have that spot, but I just think the the jump that Shea was able to make in Oklahoma this year, yeah, um, just he, he because playing in LA. Um, last year, he just wasn't really given the chance to shine as much as he um, potentially wanted to have. Um, but now being in Oklahoma with the only other kind of superstar or even just star um, on the team being Chris Paul, who's not a who's not a shoot first mindset, and with Shea having that shoot first mindset, he's gotten a lot more touches and a lot more um, shots up per game than he has in his career, and he's taken that. Like I said, he's just he's he's been able to take that next step, um, and kind of sh- show what he's able to do on a on an international level. Yeah. So now we can move on to the small forward position. I think this position is probably one of the easier positions, just because. Well, if, not if really. He plays. If he plays, if he plays, then he will <laughs> be there. Andrew Wiggins, and I think if he doesn't play, you have a very good backup from RJ Barrett. You can throw in there as well. So I think. Yeah. In fact, you do have that two-headed monster. But just talking about Wiggins, he kind of took a step forward this year. He's been a lot better than he's been in past years, a lot more consistent. He's been playmaking more. He's He really showed in Minnesota that he could be that player that they drafted a couple of years ago. Um, obviously, they used him to uh, bring in a bigger fish in D'Angelo Russell, which I think will help them in the long run. Sure. But I think – that um, Andrew Wiggins is going to be fantastic in that system for the Warriors where he doesn't have to be the guy and he can just catch the ball and shoot. And I think that being able to get set up from people like Steph Curry and Klay Thompson have that unselfish game, I think that'll always be something that he will love. And I think that's what you'll cherish in, especially if they do get that top pick and they'll be right back in playoff or in championship contention. But I think that he um, is definitely one of the best players in Canada here. And I think that he can definitely carry this team if possible. Yeah, for sure. And the thing with um, Andrew Wiggins that I think is, is going to help his career is because I always thought when he was in Minnesota that um, he was he, – he, the, the organization was making him have a bigger role than he think he, he should have had. So now that he's getting a golden state, like I said, and he's going to be playing along Steph Curry and Clay Thompson and these guys, he can kind of take more of a back seat. Um, which doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, but I think his efficiency is going to go way up. His shooting percentage is going to go way up um, because I, 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 I don't think he was um, – he's obviously a good player, but I think he is more of kind of a third, fourth option in an offense, and that's exactly where he's going to be um, come either October or whenever this season comes back, um, especially in October when Clay Thompson is going to be fully healthy and back in that lineup. He's going to be able to kind of pick his shots more – more easily um and i think he's gonna have oh, i think he's, i think what we've seen from him both in minnesota and golden state this this year is kind of only the tip of the iceberg i think he's going to continue to get better his stats might not, might not get better but like i said his efficiency his shooting percentage that sort of thing is gonna is gonna con- continue to rise um speaking of guys who are crazy efficient mm-hmm. um we have our starting power forward which is brandon clark um what was it? i saw it was a stat from the summer league, I believe, or like one of like the first games that the Grizzlies played this season, they were talking about Brandon Clark. And it was something like in his, like, however many years he played in college, he had more block shots than missed field goals. Wow. Which, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you not heard that before? I mean, playing in that Gonzaga system is fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, but it was, yeah, I think it was like he had more block shots than missed field goals in his entire career in university. Which, if that doesn't show how unbelievably efficient he is, 
yeah. then I don't know what does. Plus, I mean, his, his athleticism can take him. He, he, he's not quite there yet. He's definitely still more of a role guy on that Grizzlies team. But I think that athleticism can't be, can't be denied, right? And so if you can kind of work on the fundamentals of his game a little bit more, um, and kind of work on his jump shot a little bit because most of the shots, even though he is that efficient, are do come yeah. fairly close to the basket. So I think if he can kind of work on his mid range game a little bit, he's going to be along with John Morant. I think that that pick and roll is going to be pretty deadly for the next couple of years. Yeah, he was kind of put into an interesting position with um, Jaron Jackson and Jonas Valanciunas being there. Yeah. And I do love Valanciunas, but I think eventually they will move Jaron Jackson Jr. to the center spot and then move Brandon Clark into the starting lineup eventually. Well, the I, problem, yeah, the problem I have with that, um, I almost said the Vancouver Grizzlies and Memphis Grizzlies, Jesus Christ. You should move um, to Vancouver. Is, um, Valanciunas hasn't really been able to, because I think we're kind of getting to the point in the NBA where everyone on the floor needs to at least be able to be competent at shooting threes. Oh, yeah. And Valanciunas just hasn't been able to kind of make that um, step in his game. Whereas I think Brandon Clark isn't there yet too, but Brandon Clark has so much more time to kind of develop that, whereas Valanciunas is already kind of in the twilight of his career. So I think, I think probably at some point, either next season or the season after that, they'll switch Brandon Clark into the starting rotation. And he'll, he'll, it'll be a little bit of a smaller rotation or a smaller starting lineup. But I mean, we've seen that that works with the teams like the Rockets and stuff. So yeah, um, you don't need that. You don't need guys who are paint dominant defensively like you did in like the early 2000s or, or something like that. So Yeah. So now we can move on to probably the weaker position of our starting lineup here. Yeah. With our center. Not. Well, we have two Gonzaga guys here, so we're going to go with Kelly Olenek. I think Kelly Olenek's ability to stretch the floor is going to be fantastic for this team, especially with Brandon Clark being in the paint. I think that Olenek, obviously you can flip-flop these two if you want to. You can play Brandon Clark at center for his inside presence and then move Kelly Olenek to the power forward for his shooting. Yeah. But either way, you can do either or. Um, the, the way he has been able to shoot consistently for Miami these last couple of years has been fantastic. Um, he's definitely one of the better players for that team going into their what would have if the season comes back a playoff contention championship contention year. He's been sure. fantastic for them. Him and Myers Leonard for that team have been great stretching the floor, especially when Bam's out like when Bam's out there as well playing power forward with them. I, I think they just done, have done a fantastic job of shooting the ball, and I think Kelly Olynyk has been consistent for Canada too. He shows up for the, their leagues, so I think he's earned his spot here yeah like I said talking about him with Miami is that I think even though that Miami team does have a superstar and Jimmy Butler the reason why they were so good this year is because of their role players guys like Kelly and Linick um Tyler Hero um guys like that but Kelly Linick he, he he knows his role on that team and I think that is what makes him such a good player for for any team is he's not the guy who's gonna overstep his welcome and take more shots than he's supposed to he kind of knows what he's supposed to do and he's, he's, he's perfectly happy um, doing that. Um, moving on to our sixth man, as you you had kind of previously mentioned his name a little bit earlier when talking about Wiggins, um, we have R.J. Barrett. Um, so R.J. Barrett, he didn't have – I don't think he had quite the season that um, like 14 people were expecting. Um, I think I, um, guys like John Morant and Zion definitely overshadowed him. Yeah. But he still, I mean, for a rookie, he did have a good year. Obviously, playing for the Knicks is going to be a big spotlight to have on a young guy just starting his career. Um, so if he is able to kind of um, deal with that spotlight that comes with playing at MSG um, and then play his game, um, hopefully he doesn't have too bad, too bad of a sophomore slump, if any. But uh, I think he's definitely, out of anybody, he probably has the most – uh, him and him and she, I'd say, have the most promising futures in the NBA. Jamal Murray is kind of close behind there. Yeah. Um, but I just say, in terms of pure natural talent, and only being what nineteen, um, he might be twenty now. I haven't really checked. I don't know when his birthday is, but um, I'd say he probably has the most promising. And again, he hopefully the one thing we did actually forget to mention with Wiggins is um, 
his team might not end up. He's kind of more yeah. the one guy on this list that we're not 100% sure that he's going to actually play. Um, we're hoping he plays. Um, but even if he doesn't, I think RJ Barrett fits into that starting small forward slot very, very nicely. So. Yeah, no, I definitely think that RJ Barrett is the future for Canada. I think that he's going to have the spotlight. He's in New York City. That team needs to have a superstar. And I think yeah. he can develop into that superstar. And obviously, uh, they've they've whiffed on a couple of free agents the last couple of years. <laughs> so I think that Not RJ. The Knicks? No. No way. <laughs> that, uh, RJ is going to take that step forward and probably overtake Julius Randle as their best player next year, even. And I yeah. think that he he's just he's too good. He's got too much raw talent to not bring him in to a team and have him be the centerpiece. I think that by the time he's twenty five, he's probably going to be a three or four time All Star. Like I think. Yeah, like I said, the, the I think that I, the only really thing that I can see that um, would kind of halt his growth is if he can't take the spotlight of. Yeah. Which I mean, lots of people have not been able to do that in the past. So. Hopefully he's able to, but on the odd chance that he's not, then he might kind of flounder for his first couple of years in the league. And then once he kind of can get out of New York and go to a, a better culture for a team, then he might be able to fit in a little bit more. Yeah, so let's kind of move on now to the seventh man and the most established Canadian player, I think, on this team is uh, Corey Joseph. He's always been there for us. He's, thir- he's in the later half of his career now. He's 30 now, and I think – the fact that he, championship winner, yeah, he, yeah, like he's he's done all the things that you need from him, and the fact that he's kind of came into his own with Team Canada. He usually averages in between fifteen and twenty points a game whenever he plays for us. So obviously he's gonna have to take a step back this year with Murray being there. But I think he's yeah. a fantastic player, a fantastic veteran for any team, and I think he's only gonna continue to grow with this team Canada. I think, like I said, like I, I don't think he's going to be putting up quite those numbers that he did in previous years. But again, he, like you said, he's just going to be a good locker room guy that you like to have around, um, you know, kind of show. Cause they, the Canadian team does have a lot of young guys right now. So um, yeah, I think if he just kind of helps mentor them and show them how, to, what it's like to play on the national stage, it'll definitely help team chemistry quite a bit. Yeah, no, for um, sure. So kind of our next, like, we we do – we have full all the way to 8 to 15. But really outside of a couple of guys, we, I, I personally don't really have too, too much to talk about for for a lot of these guys. Um, the, the two, there's only really two guys that um, I think are, are worth talking about, and that would probably be Nikhil Alexander-Walker and then Chris Boucher. So another two young guys that – um. And and obviously, obviously, Chris Boucher, um, really, he's not, he's not great at basketball at the moment. He's just crazy athletic. And yeah. so, again, I think if he's, he's going to be kind of similar to Brandon Clark if he's able to um, kind of figure out, you know, get a jump shot down, kind of get a little bit higher basketball IQ, get in the film room, figure out defenses, that sort of thing. He'll be able to be a nice rotational piece for the Raptors. Yeah, I think even that, more so as he already is. Yeah, I think that like with Marcus All coming up with his retirement probably in the next couple of years here, whether we keep him or not, I think um that Chris Boucher can come in and be that backup that they definitely need. Um but I'm also just gonna list the rest of the players we have in our starting yeah, ten rotation. Sure. Uh Dwight Powell, great player for the Dallas Mavericks. Dylan Brooks is really coming to his own with the Memphis Grizzlies with their high octane offense. Um, obviously, Chris Boucher, you know, Alexander Walker. We have Ken Birch, who you don't really see a whole lot of them. We got Brissett. We have Trey Lyles, and we have the best player on the team, Nick Stauskas. <laughs> yeah, so even like, I mean, obviously the guys of the lower list, they're like Trey Lyles and Nick Stauskas, probably won't be getting a whole lot of play, playing time. Yeah. But even if we only have like a nine-man rotation, you go Jamal Murray, Shea Wiggins, Brandon Clark, Kelly Olenek, and then off the bench you have R.J. Barrett. Um, Chris Boucher, Dwight Powell, and then Alexander Walker. Like that's a that's a I mean that's a team that I think can go up against a lot of a lot of good Olympic teams. Yeah, no, just 
We are going to compare them to the U.S. team, which uh, oh yeah, we're gonna, if we ever have to go up against the U.S., we're getting smoked. But yeah, no, if we ever compare <laughs> to them, it's definitely not a contest. Like this Team USA team that we've kind of assembled ourselves here is pretty insane. And so before we kind of get into it, I just do want to just explain kind of how we how we pick this lineup. So all these guys um, are on the short list um, for people that the Team USA is actually looking towards. So. Um, you're not going to see Kevin Durant. Um, you're not going to see uh, who else uh, Zion. See? Embiid, Zion, just because they simply weren't on the list. Yeah. Um, so I think the list is about 30 people, so we kind of narrowed it in half. Um, who we think would be the best fit, who do you think would play? <laughs> they'd be most likely to pick, because I know they, they do kind of like to pick a lot of like younger guys. That and then a few kind of more experienced guys to kind of lead the team. Yeah. And but, then we also kind of based it around if we thought these players were going to play or not. I think um, for sure. Some players, like for example, we didn't think of Kevin Durant was going to play, or we didn't think and somebody. Kyrie. Yeah, we didn't think that those Kyrie, two were going to play. Kyrie was on the list, but because of injuries and yeah, his. Um, so yeah, we kind of looked at health as well as a factor in this as well to see if we thought these players would play. So um, we, we have one person on here we'll talk about later who we were kind of on the fence about because he has had that injury this last year. So we kind of, yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit. So if, if you want to start with our point guard, no? I'll start with the point guard. All right, so point guard, I mean, I think this is a pretty easy choice to have our starting point guard. Uh, it's Steph Curry. Um, he's, I mean, there's not a lot we can say about Steph Curry that hasn't already been said. He's really revolutionized the game. Um, he's the reason why a lot of guys are coming into the league, like Trey Young and them, who are so um, dependent on the three uh, because it is guys like Steph Curry. I mean, you look at even just like shot charts for every single NBA team and the amount of threes that are now being shot compared to even just five, ten years ago. Um, he's, he's had one of the biggest impacts we've ever seen as a single player have on the game. And so it's a pretty easy decision to have him as the starting point guard for the team. Yeah, we uh, we wanted to have a high-octane shooting backcourt for sure because we know the Olympics does rely on shooting a lot yeah. and does have the kind of an older fashion. There's some teams that are older fashioned, but I feel like this Team USA team is just going to try and hit bomb after bomb. So we went with our, our shooting guard as Devin Booker. I think that by the time next year he will be – well, he we, they have a very stacked shooting guard list. Like we, it was a very hard decision to choose between three people. Very much but so. We chose Booker because, like, I felt personally that by the time the Olympics happened, he will be the best shooting guard in the league. He might already be, but we just kind of felt that having those two who can shoot the ball and play make the way they do would be a fantastic backcourt to start with. Yeah, I feel like if if anybody, if we could have chosen from any shooting guard in the league. I probably would have put James Harden over him, but again, James Harden wasn't one of the guys that was on the finalist list. And if he so, was, we just felt that he wouldn't play. Yeah. Uh, moving on to shooting or small forward, sorry. Um, this is another one where we weren't sure if he's going to play because he is kind of getting up there in age. Um, it's LeBron. Um, the only reason why I believe that he would is because I think this is kind of his last chance to play. Yeah. Because um, next Olympics, he's going to be 40, 40 plus. And I think at that point he's going to be long retired, so he might not be. He might not. He might not start even. He might kind of just be more of a mentor kind of role. But I think he wouldn't want to pass up the chance to play one more Olympics. So yeah, especially because like obviously if he plays, you're not going to not put him in the starting lineup. Oh yeah. And then just to kind of. His teammate as well with Anthony Davis. Those two, we put those two together just because we felt like if LeBron plays, AD will play. Just because I think they're going to throw uh, that. Again, I don't know if LeBron doesn't play, then we kind of agreed that Anthony Davis wouldn't play either. Yeah, just because I feel like if LeBron feels like he needs to take it off and have that for training, I feel like Anthony Davis would follow him and do the same. Yeah. And just the fact that they kind of are a package right now and they kind of don't want to risk too much because they are in that championship window right now. We felt that if they don't play, they won't play. If they do play, well, they'll both play. Yeah. So, yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't see a scenario where one of them plays and one of them doesn't. Unless yeah. unless one of them gets selected and the other doesn't. But I think if that happened, then 
the other would just drop the team. I don't think. Yeah, I don't. I don't see a situation where only one of them plays. I don't really see, uh, a, situation where, oh, sorry. I don't really see a position where they would. I think there'd be riots if one of those two didn't make the team. <laughs> True. <laughs> uh, moving on to our center position. Honestly, the center position was not that great in terms of the guys that um, were on this list. Yeah. Um, so we went with Bam, Bam Adebayo. Um, he, we felt he was the best other option. Um, the only other center that we picked in our lineup is Andre Drummond, and we'll kind of get to him later. But, yeah, I mean, I mean Bam, obviously, he was an all-star this year. He's definitely taken that step um, this past season in Miami. Um, but – he, uh, I, don't know, I think there's lots of other centers that I would have preferred over him. Yeah, for example, if, if anybody gets mad at us for not picking Carl Anthony Towns, like he wasn't on the short list, so yeah, he can't be there. So, like, this is not our dream team, this is our they made the short list, Realistic. so yeah, and, and another situation that, um, could potentially happen. I could see it happening. Um, is they slide Anthony Davis to the five, and then just play LeBron, and then you could throw one of these other players like Tatum or something into the position. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, so it's, but it's, again, we the only reason we put Anthony Davis as the power forward is because that is his preferred position. Yeah, he prefers to play that position and put Bam in at the starting starting five. And Bam, don't get me wrong, you Bam's a great player. Like he's been fantastic for the Heat this year, playmaking. He's really took a step forward in his game. So oh, yeah. that, we that's why we felt he would be better over Drummond. But it's all about preference really. If this team wants to have Chuckers and then have Andre Drummond to get the offensive board, they could do that too. Yeah, there's there's so many different ways that this team could be be arranged. Yeah. Um, we just kind of, we, for the sake of simplicity, we just kind of went the best guys starting at their preferred positions. Um, but with that being said, did you want to take over the uh, the sixth man? Uh, I'm going to talk about the seventh man and let you talk about the sixth man because I know right. you're a big fan of the sixth man. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go with seven with Tatum. Um, I do, I love Tatum's game. I think he's done fantastic this year, kind of taking over that number one scoring option with the. Um, Boston Celtics. He's been fantastic these last couple of months, and I feel like he's going to be a star in this league. Last year, I was a little bit skeptical just because he did kind of have a slump a little bit, but man, this year he's been absolutely he's turned it on. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I think we we did a list. I think a couple months ago, where I was saying he's overrated, but um, I think the fact that he's been so good this season. For the Celtics, and I think he's going to continue to grow, and I think he's a fantastic player here to start. So I think he's going to continue to be that. And so he has to be on Team Canada or Team US. Team, I wish he was on Team Canada. That'd be fantastic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So as you mentioned, I'm a big fan of the six man that we have here. It's Damian Lillard. Um, I didn't think he was he was able to take another step, but somehow this past season he was able to take another step. Um, again, a guy similar to. He's kind of getting to where he, he can get it to Steph Curry range at this point. Like, new new nickname, Logo Lillard, this past year. Yeah. Um, that kind of started with his um, playoff winning buzzer beater yeah. against the Thunder last year. But, I mean, he's he's turned it on. And it's a, it's a shame that the Trailblazers haven't really been able to build a team around him. No. Hello. <laughs> Cut oh, this out. Hi, Mike. <laughs> hey, oh. Hi. Good, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just make sure that we cut that part out. Yeah. No, not. It doesn't matter. Your mom can make an appearance. Um, Three, two, one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, just yeah, no, back so, to Lillard. Yeah. Back to Lillard. Um, is he's? I mean, it's a, it's a shame that the Trailblazers haven't been able to build a team around him because he is just such a once in a lifetime kind of player. Yeah. Um, but hopefully, when Nurkic comes back next season, they're going to be a little bit better. But they got to. So excuse me. Um, they got to do something with that team. Um, as much as I like CJ, I don't think he's worth the money that they paid him. And Melo. <laughs> and Melo, yeah. But yeah, no, uh, I could see them trading CJ in the off season. I just think it's not working for him. Yeah, they got they got to break that that uh, that duo up. As much as they're fun to watch, they just they've been. 
I would say the last year making it to the conference finals, they've kind of been a first or second um second round out for the past couple of years. And I just that's just not what you want to see. You want yeah. to see a little improvement each year and then not even going to be making the playoffs this year. Well, we thought they were we kind of thought they thought they were taking that step forward. They made the conference finals last year. Kind of seems like this year, like if something happened with the LA teams, that they could take that step and maybe make a finals run, but they've just, they've had injury problems. They've, they've took gambles that haven't worked. They've took gambles that have worked. Like Hassan Whiteside and Melo have been great additions, but at the same time, CJ's had an off year and he's been hurt for most of the season and Nurkic hasn't been here all year. Yeah, I think, I think not having Nurk is a big, is a big issue for them. I think, um, I really hope back next year, then they might be a little bit better because, as much as I like Hassan Whiteside, I think if they had both Whiteside and Nurk, they would have been a really, really good team. I really hope that they do find a way to play those two together, maybe throw Nurk as the power forward, maybe. But I don't know what their situation is going to be with that. I think they might um, – an idea that has been thrown out a lot is Hassan Whiteside for Kevin Love, and that would be a fantastic trade for them, I think. Just being. I think, able- we, I think we talked about that um, yeah. in our trade deadline show, and I think – I can, I can, like, I, I like that one. I think it works. I think it works for both teams. Yeah, just gonna move on here to our eighth spot here. Uh, we went Donovan Mitchell. We felt that he's been the best player on the Utah Jazz, and he's kind of been the anchor for a long time. I wouldn't say a long time for the last two years there. And um, the fact that he did take a step as fast as he did, nobody really thought that when he came out of Louisville. Um, and the fact that he was, he's been so great for that team, kind of the way Tatum stepped up, he stepped up as well for him. Absolutely. And he's really solidified himself as a future star as well. And I think that it's a pretty easy spot to have him here, but not quite starting, but he's here for sure. Well, and the, and the one thing is that um, I guess we've kind of forgot to mention earlier is typically the U.S. likes to take a lot of like younger guys on yeah. the team with only like a few kind of, and they love taking guards. <laughs> they love guards. Uh, so we do only kind of have two guys who are kind of in like the back half of their careers. We have a lot of younger guys. Yeah. Um, and again, that trend follows their ninth man being Brandon Ingram. Guy much like Jason Tatum has taken that step being out of LA. Um, has a little bit less pressure on him. Um, going from playing with LeBron and being expected to be a playoff team, now kind of um, being in more of a rebuilding situation. Um, with guys like Zion, Lonzo, um, that and that young core, he's been able to shine in that. And I think um, if he's able to kind of continue what he's been doing this year, and with Zion getting better and better, feels like every single game, um, they're going to be a pretty scary team next year. Yeah, I know that uh, that team is going to be scary for years to come. <laughs> I think, especially um, with that to that lob from from Lonzo to Zion, sorry. But uh that full core one? Yeah, like any yeah. anything they do, man, like those two can just not run all together. Yeah. And now we're gonna move on to the number ten spot for us. And we went with more of a specialist here. I do like Drummond's game in the post, but he can't really do a whole lot outside of it. But um I just said his name it is Andre Drummond. Um he was traded to the Cavs in a very weird trade during the uh, Super trade deadline. Trade. Um, and he, he's been okay. He hasn't really changed the Cavs organization, but if they do decide to not trade Kevin Love and decide to be continuing to try to be a contender with their young core, then Andre Drummond would be a good guy for him. They had Tristan Thompson as a um, offensive rebound specialist for him in the past. So having a guy like Drummond in there would be good for him. We picked him here just for his rebounding, and we felt that he was better than Mason Plumley. Um, I know a lot of Americans were really mad last time that we had a tournament like this, and Mason Plumley was there, and he was pretty useless. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was like really. I think Mason Plumley was on this list, but we just felt Drummond. We just needed a backup center more than we, anything. We felt that Drummond would be the guy here instead of yeah, Mason Plumley. <laughs> um. So these next, and so um, we do have another five guys on the list here. 
Um, but we don't really believe they're going to be getting too, too many minutes. Um, and he also, we kind of added a couple of guys who we felt maybe they wouldn't play as well, just, just because we felt we needed to add some guys to the roster. Yeah, so we have, I'll just kind of run down these next five lists, and then if either one of us have anything to talk about with either any of them, um, we can. So the next five that are just kind of to fill out the roster um, are Jalen Brown, Kyle Lowry, Chris Paul, Clay Thompson, and Kemba Walker. Um, I think the biggest one that um, there's the biggest name is Clay Thompson. Yeah. Um, again, him not playing this past year um, kind of leads to skepticism as to whether he would play um, for USA if the Olympics were happening this year. Um, the only reason I put him on, I felt that he would be on the list is because even if he doesn't get a whole lot of minutes, it'd be a really good tune up for him for the beginning of next season. I'm just going to get out, play teams that. Or like get out and play fast-paced five-on-five games that aren't just scrimmages against other Golden State Warriors guys or anything like that. Yeah, um, and just kind of get them back into game shape a little bit before the season starts. Uh, so I think it'd be beneficial for both him and the USA team. Yeah, we also base this around if the Olympics were this year, we didn't really base it around next year. We just yeah. felt like it would be kind of crazy. So that's why, again, you don't see Kyrie, you don't see KD, you don't really see Kawhi or Paul George because they're beat up. Yeah. Um, somebody I, want, I wanted to talk about was Kyle Lowry. I think... Uh, Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> he played the last Olympics and got the gold medal with them. He's um, been in a table part for the U.S. for the, the last couple competitions they've been a part of. So the fact that I think they're going to continue to be loyal to him that could also be a reason that DeMar could also be there as well if they, they do choose to go that direction. But um, we chose to put Cal in there because we felt that he would be there for him. Um, we didn't choose Harrison Barnes despite the Americans' love for him. They love they love putting him on the – him like him and Mason Bowman, I literally don't understand it. Like Harrison Barnes, like we got – like five, four years ago, I get it. Like he was, he was decent then and he was young and he had a lot of talent. But now, like, he's getting older. He's 28. He's playing on a Sacramento team where he's not getting the ball that much. He's only averaging, like, 12 points a game. Like, there's so many other people you could pick and you're choosing Harrison Barnes. You're choosing Harrison Barnes over players like De'Aaron Fox. And, like, that, in my opinion, is (laughs) ridiculous. Like, you're choosing Mason Plumlee over a person like Carl Anthony Towns. Yeah, I – I can't really argue with that on that on any of what you just said there. So, um, and then one of the other guys I want to talk about is just Chris Paul. Yeah. Um, he was the other guy I mentioned who's kind of in the later part of his career. But I think with him and LeBron just having so much experience, not only in the NBA but also other Olympics, yeah, he'll have a lot to bring, a lot of experience to bring to the younger guys who this might be their first Olympics. So, yeah, we also definitely felt like this team needed to have some veterans they had a lot of young guys during that competition last year and they came in fifth so they did not do very well yeah they didn't have a great performance so i think we felt like bringing in more veterans would help them with the leadership and stuff like that and i guess the team wasn't that good when they were in those other competitions so we felt like we wanted to make a better team and that's our team yeah so that about about wraps everything up for is there anything else you want to mention about the Olympics or anything like that? Um, I kind of want to give some shout outs to other teams like Serbia, Croatia, obviously with Jokic and Luka on those teams. Uh, Spain Greece. always has a great team. Greece with Giannis. Um, Argentina with uh, Luis Scola. <laughs> um, we were looking at pictures. The Bahamas? Do those the Bahamas, eight, yeah. And who else do they have? Um, Buddy. Buddy Hill, yeah. So they're going to be a pretty, pretty decent team. Yeah, we saw we saw pictures the other day. We were looking when we were doing some studying for this. We um, saw pictures of the Argentina team, and Luis Scola with his Luis short, Scola still holding it down. His short gray hairs leading the team in points, rebounds, and assists. The last time they all played. He so is the team. shout out to <laughs> Luis Scola for still carrying that Argentina team. Surprised Mohan is not there, but hey, couldn't you do? Um, but yeah, yes, it's, can, uh, it's unfortunate that the, the Olympics aren't going to be happening this year, but I look forward to next year and watching all these guys play. Because I, I 
I personally, the Olympic basketballs, I think it's, I, it's, it's super fun to watch because you get to watch just this God squad US team just annihilate all these, <laughs> all these other teams. <laughs> But yeah, just kind of going into our next topic here, we were talking about those foreign players. So let's talk about our top 25 foreign players in the league. So um, might, do you mind, mind if we do that in another podcast? Yes, we can do that in another one. Okay, because I got I to gotta give the grandparents a call. Okay, so, <laughs> okay cool, because we're at 40 minutes, so that works. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do this one, and then we'll do another one. I guess I, I just sent a chat to the Zoom thing. We'll cut this part away. I need to worry about it. Um, okay. just about like doing that either later tonight or tomorrow because like I said my grandparents already called me like 45 minutes ago so yeah for sure get back to them yeah okay yeah so with that in mind we will see you guys at the next podcast see y'all later au revoir <laughs>